everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us today for Girlfriend's Guide to Breast Cancer Screening. I'm Brianna Schwarz, Charcharit's Florida Regional Director. In the spirit of today's theme of educating our girlfriends, I will be co-leading today's webinar with my colleague and friend, Jenna Fields, the California Regional Director of Charcharit. Today's program is part of our Charcharit Summit, an initiative marking Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Over the course of 10 days, Charcharit is offering a unique array of national programs, campaigns, and opportunities. We're putting a link in the chat to register for the summit programs. Two upcoming highlights include on Wednesday, October 13th at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific is an Instagram Live which is Ask Us Anything, Cancer Genetics and Beyond BRCA or BRCA. Thursday, October 14th at 1 p.m. Eastern and 10 a.m. Pacific, we have Therapeutic Baking 101, which is a webinar for our Embrace community. And again, the link to that is in the chat. For those of you who may be new to Sharshara, we help Jewish women and families facing breast and ovarian cancer, as well as those who are at elevated genetic risk through free, confidential, and personalized support resources, support and resources. We also provide health education throughout the country. Before we begin, a few housekeeping items. You were muted as you enter today's program, so please stay on mute so that we can clearly hear today's presenters. As always, this program will be recorded. No faces or names will show on the recording other than those of the presenters. But if you wish to turn your video off for privacy now, you have the option to do that. It is on the bottom left side of your screen. You can also choose to rename yourself if you prefer to remain anonymous. You can do that by clicking on the three dots in the top right of your photo square. You will be notified when the recording and transcript of today's program is posted on the Sharsharit website. So please feel free to share those links with anyone who may be interested. I want to thank our wonderful sponsor for today's webinar, Ice Cur, and to all of the sponsors for the Sharsharit Summit. The slide was on earlier and will be on at the end of the program. Just a reminder that Sharsharit is a national not-for-profit cancer support and education organization and does not provide any medical advice or perform any medical procedures. The information provided by Sharsharit is not a substitute for medical advice or treatment for specific medical conditions. You should not use this information to diagnose or treat a health problem. Always seek the advice of your physician or qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. And now I'm going to turn it over to my girlfriend, Jenna Fields, California Regional Director for Sharsharit. Jenna? Hi, everybody. I am so excited to be here with my girlfriends today, and um, I'm really excited to learn more about screening. I think for, for all of us, we have different motivations for attending this webinar. Whether you have a family member that was diagnosed, maybe you yourself have been diagnosed, um, or perhaps you have hereditary risk for cancer. Um, we want you to know that wherever you are, Sharshara is here for you. We have social workers on staff that provide individualized support to guide you through this process, help you um, figure out questions to ask your doctor, to give you the emotional support you need and handholding, whether you've been diagnosed or you're a caregiver or you're high risk. We also have a peer support network that's available where we match women with each other so you can ask questions and learn from other women who've been through this. And we also have a genetic counselor on staff. We're going to be talking just a little bit about genetics today. Um, and our genetic counselor is available to provide more information for you and your family. And of course, we're going to put everything in the chat where you can figure out um, how to reach out to us if you need to. So in the spirit of girlfriends, um, Brianna and I decided that there was no one better to share her personal story today than uh, our, our partner, our Illinois Regional Director for Sharsharit, Eve, who's going to tell us a little bit about her journey uh, with cancer screening. So welcome, Eve. Thank you, Jenna. Um, I am so thrilled to be here, and it's great to be together, all of us girlfriends, all at once. Um, and so I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about my own personal background with breast screening. Uh, I grew up knowing that uh, my family had a strong cancer history on both sides. My grandmother had breast cancer. My aunt then was diagnosed with breast cancer. So it really shouldn't have come as a shock to us when my mother was diagnosed as well. 
Um, and since I'm the youngest of four daughters, by the time I came to an age of cancer screening and to make choices for my own health, I had three really good examples with the same genes as I had um, to follow and decide what to do. I always would go into my OBGYN's office each year and I was ready to talk about our family history, talk about breast cancer and prostate cancer, and this is what we need to deal with. And I was always met with let's talk about your genetics. And I knew about our family's genetics. I didn't really need to start with the conversation there. I really wanted to move forward and talk about when do I get to get my first mammogram? Not that that's an exciting thing for most people, but when you know that this is part of your life, you know, this is what's next. And doctors to no fault of their own said, well, let's talk about genetics first before we jump into a referral for a mammogram. And uh, it took a little bit of time, but eventually we covered the genetics that I already knew. And I was able to see a, um, my own breast specialist who was <clears throat> really excited that I had come then. She was a little bit uh, concerned that I hadn't come a few years earlier, but she said, this is really the time. And that for people with my family history, it was important to get in, even if you feel like when you read that title of the doctor and you feel like that's not for me, I don't have breast cancer. It's to do it before you have breast cancer. And she feels like, you know, not enough of her patients are doing that. So we came in and we talked about what were those options and by way of my background, I have a sister who had chosen to go the prophylactic surgery route. And so she had had a double mastectomy with reconstruction. I had sisters who had gone um, the route of doing screening, some with different types of screening. Each doctor had a slightly different answer. And I wasn't sure what was ahead of me. I did know that I was still in that stage of having my babies and I wanted to be able to breastfeed and I didn't want to start with surgeries then. And so I really wanted to talk about screening options. And she was very, very calming and let me know that the possibilities with screening these days are so amazing. And so we set up a schedule doing alternating mammograms and breast MRIs with the option of an occasional ultrasound if that was necessary. And Mammogram started out and that was totally fine. And I feel like we talk a lot um, in sort of breast screening world about mammograms and almost all of our mothers and grandmothers hopefully have had mammograms. And so you've heard about it and you can think about it and conceptualize it. It's when you get to the breast MRI that was a little bit of a, a, an odd experience because you maybe you've had an MRI of you know your knee or your back or something for a different um, part of your body. And the breast MRI to me just felt different. You know, you're laying um, sort of in this weird position on the table and you're trying to stay really still. And of course, uh, my, my luck was that after my first breast MRI, unfortunately, I got that dreaded phone call from a doctor saying, um, we need to do some follow-up screening. There's a suspicious mass that we've found. Uh, and what I learned later is that oftentimes this does happen with your first breast MRI because they've never seen your breasts in that way. And they're just seeing it all for the first time, especially when you're young and you have dense breasts. And it was a terrible two weeks where, to be totally honest, I thought over those two weeks, maybe I should just go the prophylactic surgery route. Screening is not for me. But uh, once I got the results that I was totally benign and I was doing okay, I let the next six months pass without thinking about surgery again. Uh, and actually last month I went for my next breast MRI and I started to have that thought again, like, can I deal with that stress? Is this stress worth it? And for right now it is. Um, but I think that talking to others, uh, hearing from others who are going through that routine of screening that you're alternating your mammograms and your MRIs and your ultrasounds and having others to talk to, whether for me, it's my own sisters, uh, or those at Sure Share It, or if one doesn't have family members talking to a peer support at Sure Share It, it's just so helpful to hear that others are going through this experience and you don't have to decide to go through a surgery yet. You can keep that on the back burner, which is how I feel, and that maybe my decision will change year to year. But for right now, this is where I'm at and I'm comfortable. Um, but again, it's so important to be prepared and know what you're getting into. And that way you can definitely feel good about your decision. Because if you have to go into that MRI or mammogram feeling like maybe you're making the wrong decision, then it might not um, 
feel like the right call. So I highly recommend talking to others about it. Uh, and if you have any concerns, also ask your doctor, because I think that the MRIs are so nerve wracking, but uh, definitely the right call for me for right now. So I just want to thank you all for being here and for letting me share my story about breast screening. And I can't wait to hear from our presenters today. Thank you so much, Eve. I know we, we turned the tables on you. You're usually the ones leading these webinars. And today we got to hear a little bit of your story. And um, I know it definitely sparked questions for me and I'm excited to learn more from uh, the booby doc. So without further ado, I'm gonna introduce our wonderful booby docs, Dr. Robin Roth and Dr. Adrian Rosenthal, who are diagnostic radiologists at MD Anderson at Cooper University Healthcare. Uh, they both received their medical degree from Albert Einstein College of Medicine. And Dr. Roth did her fellowship at University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Rosenthal did hers at Albert Einstein. They are hosts of the podcast, The Booby Docs, The Girlfriend's Guide to Breast Cancer, Breast Health, and Beyond, and bring their expertise to Instagram. If you don't follow them, they're at Booby Docs. Uh, last week, they were on the Today Show, and now they're here with us. So we are <laughs> so excited to welcome you. And without further ado, uh, the floor is yours. So another hi, hi this week. Yeah. We're through, we uh -oh. should you know what? I need to <laughs> Sorry, we're not technically we're not technically challenged. We're technically we have an challenged. echo. Wait, I need to turn this off. Okay, this is the opening act, folks. All right. <laughs> well, thank you for having us. We're thrilled to be here. Another high high being with Char Sherrett. Last week we got to be on the Today Show. It was so much fun. Um, more of a just a plug so that women can start annual screening at the age of 40. A lot of women don't know that. So that was kind of our mission for uh, our Today Show appearance. So we got to check that box and we're thrilled to be here today. So thanks for having us. Yeah. And we love Char Sherrett. I mean, we love Char Sherrett. <laughs> It Big fan girls <laughs> fan doctors. <laughs> All right, we're gonna get started because you have a lot of stuff to cover in this lecture and we were supposed to keep it 30 minutes or less. So we're gonna talk fast, but if you have questions, I see a chat box. We're gonna have some time at the end um, for everyone to ask questions. So uh, a little bit about ourselves. Let me uh, just make sure this is working. This is me. I am Dr. Robin Roth, Robin Gartner, for those who know me from college. I went to college with Brianna. I'm from South Florida, I went to University of Florida. Um, went Went to med school in New York with Adrian at Albert Einstein College of Medicine. That's where we met. That's how it started. Yep. <laughs> um, like you said, I did. I went to Montefiore and Penn for residency and did it my fellowship at Penn. I have three kids that are young, two, four, and six. There I am. <laughs> <laughs> um, what did, what, yeah, give me my info. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm from Cherry Hill, New Jersey, which is where we practice now. Went to Barnard undergrad. Robin and I overlapped at Einstein. I then went to Einstein in Philadelphia for uh, residency and then Cornell for breast fellowship. Uh, and I'm a mom of three boys, five, seven, and nine. So just our quick story for those who don't follow us, we've been best friends since best friend since day one of med school. Actually, our third friend is also a booby doc. Her name is Karen Gam. She's on your medical board, which is really cool. I think she's the one who put you on our put us on your radar. Um, we've been, we did intern year. We've been working together at Cooper for several years and every day is a blessing. <laughs> yes, but enough about it. <laughs> yeah. Um, and like, if, if we call ourselves a booby doc, my grandma always called it boobies, breast boobies. And we started this in 2018 to talk about breast health in an approachable way. Um, we recently launched our podcast, which we're really excited about. And we hope uh, people get lots of good information from there. So check it out. Every, new episodes every two weeks. Um, so the goals of the lecture are really to talk about who gets breast cancer and who's at increased risk. Um, talk about breast cancer screening controversies of which there are many. Um, illustrate the effect of breast density on screening mammogram and ways to discuss um, uh, improved cancer detection. So, but the real goals are to answer your questions regarding when do you start screening, how often, do I need an extra screening test, and what do I tell, what, what happens if I'm newly diagnosed with breast cancer? Um, so who gets breast cancer? So one in eight women in the U.S. will develop invasive breast cancer over her lifetime. That translates to 12%. Uh, one in 833 in men, so we're dealing with a much smaller number. It's the second most common cancer in the U.S. in women 
after skin cancer and breast cancer became the most common cancer globally as of 2021, accounting for 12% of all new annual cases worldwide, according to the World Health Organization. So it's the second most common cancer death in women, surprisingly after lung. Um, and this year over, you know, it affects a lot of women and then their families, you know, so an estimated 281,000 will be diagnosed with invasive breast cancer. When you're talking about DCIS or in situ early cancer, that's much higher than that. Also, uh, another 49,000 of in situ cancer. That's when we would like to catch it um, when it hasn't spread beyond the duct. Um, and an estimated 43,000 women will die this year from breast cancer. So it is a treatable disease if it's caught early, but obviously, and that's like why early detection is key, um, but certainly many lives are lost from breast cancer. Um, when we talk about breast cancer, you know, we always talk about 40, that's like the magic number, but really rates, there, about 5% of cases do occur under women uh, in women under age 40, um, you know, when you choose a screening test, when to start for a screening test, you have to choose like the most cost effective way to save the most lives. So it's not like women, 40 is an, an arbitrary number where the curve starts increasing. Most women are, um, you know, at, breast cancer becomes more common as you get older, most common in women over 70, but it still remains the leading cause of death and uh, cancer death in women ages 20 to 59. It's also the most common uh, cancer during pregnancy in the postpartum period. Um, and you look at this line right here is the 40. So th these are all the people that are going to be diagnosed before age 40. And that's really the people that, you know, we support the self-breast exam because we think that it's, if you're not being screened, it's really up to you to find changes in your breast, which is why we really support being aware of how your breasts look and feel. I know Women often say my breasts are so lumpy. That's normal for you though. So if it becomes not lumpy or there's a lump that feels different than the other lumpy, you know, breasts, that's when you start to get concerned. And that's what we're really trying to emphasize here. We hear so many women in the under 40 category have been diagnosed with breast cancer, people telling them that they're too young to have breast cancer. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, breast cancer doesn't follow that rule as some of the other cancers that we know about. We have a high Ashkenazi Jewish population in our community, and we see lots of women in their 30s and even in their 20s being diagnosed with breast cancer. As so you know, it does happen. part of your mission, yes. which we love about you guys. Um, so the two greatest risk factors for developing cancer are just being female and getting older. Um, your risk doubles if you have a first degree relative affected with breast cancer, but only five to 10% of cases have a known genetic predisposition, which means about 90% don't, um, most commonly BRCA1 and BRCA2, um, but 85% of women diagnosed with breast cancer have no family history. So that's important to remember. So just because my cousins ended up being BRCA out of nowhere, uh, had a spontaneous mutation and, and developed breast cancer in their 30s. So we didn't have any known genetic risk, but now we do. Um, so things, mutations can spontaneously occur too. So breast cancer demographics is most common in whites, uh, closely followed by the Blacks community. Black women have higher incidence rates before age 40. Age 40. So 20 to 40% of higher breast cancer mortality rates, um, the higher percentage of more aggressive or more aggressive triple negative cancers, uh, and there's less access to mammography and genetic counseling. Uh, delays in diagnosis and treatment negatively affects this and less likely to be diagnosed with stage one uh, BCA, twice as likely to die of early breast cancer, which is pretty dramatic when you break that down. Yeah, there are certainly, um, you know, racial disparities in breast cancer screening that are very important, um, not only in screening and treatment as well. So when you're talking about breast cancer risk factors, we really break it down into modifiable and not modifiable. So things you can't change, being female, getting older, you know, genetic causes, family history of breast cancer, usually in a first degree relative, personal history of breast cancer, um, ethnicity we talked about. Um, dense breast tissue makes it harder to find breast cancer, but it's also an independent risk factor for developing cancer. Um, the earlier that you've had, um, periods, like the longer you're having menstrual cycles is a, a, a factor. Uh, if you've ever had uh, chest wall radiation, uh, if you've had cancer when you were in your, when you were younger and you had mantle cell lymphoma, about 20 years later, you're, you're actually eight to 10 years later, you're at risk for developing cancer. Um, so things that are modifiable, so things that people can change. So having children is slightly protective. Um, 
oral contraceptives have a slight increased risk, uh, hormone therapy, um, breastfeeding has a slight uh, risk reduction, alcohol, obesity, those all increase your risk uh, for breast cancer. So who is at risk? So like we said, genetics-based increased risk, strong family history and first degree relatives. Um, we'll I'll show you that how we calculate your lifetime risk, which you could do online. Um, if you ever had chest wall radiation, personal history of breast cancer and dense breast tissue, those diagnosed with premenopausal breast cancer. So if you're diagnosed before age 50, or if you've ever had an atypical biopsy, if you had a biopsy that showed atypical ductal hyperplasia or LCIS. Um, this is an important uh, recommendation from the Society of Breast Imaging and the American College of Radiology that I want to point out. It says all women, especially black women and those of Ashkenazi Jewish descent should be evaluated for breast cancer risk by age 30 to, to identify the people that may benefit from early screening or more frequent screening. I don't know how many people are actually doing that. I've, I don't think I've ever been screened for. I was actually screened coincidentally because that's when I got my Jewish genetic testing mm -hmm. and Einstein for my pregnancies. So I, I believe I got the information that I was bracket negative at that point, but certainly I'm not, you know, in the main stream of, of situations with women in their thirties. Right. So it's, it, it is something to be aware of. I think it's yeah, part of so, your mission. And I think that you could do it online and I'll show you how. Um, so breast cancer risk assessment, if you plug it into the tool and you're over the 20 to 25% lifetime risk, that's considered high risk. Those are the people that we would say you should see a genetic counselor and they may benefit from supplemental MRI in addition to the screening mammogram. Um, the American Cancer Society supports three models to predict your lifetime risk of breast cancer. We use Tyra Cruzic most commonly, um, which looks like this. So if you go online, you could type in Tyra Cruzic calculator. It's also called the IBIS model. Um, and you could plug this in. If you're over 40 and you know your breast density, they do take that into account. Um, that's a new development. And if you don't know your breast density, you can reference your, um, mammogram, your mammogram or yeah. your mammogram. But report. you leave that out if you don't have it. Um, so, you know, ask your age, BMI, when you had your first period, how many kids you have, all that stuff. So this is a good tool. This is what um, some genetic counselors might use. Um, so this is an important slide, who should be referred to a genetic counselor? So, you know, when we start having uh, patients that are diagnosed with premenopausal breast cancer, so before age 50, multiple breast cancers or a second cancer in the same breast, triple negative cancer before age 60, um, Ashkenazi Jewish descent, um, you know, tend to have a strong family history, a higher risk of BRCA, we'll talk about that, um, and also strong family history when you start hearing, you know, breast, ovarian, pancreatic, multiple different types of cancers and family members especially first degree relatives, they would benefit from genetic counselor. But honestly, I think anyone can benefit from a genetic counselor and they might tell you, you're not at high risk, you know, and you'll feel better. Um, so BRCA and BRCA1 and BRCA2 are the most common cause of hereditary breast cancer, but they only make up about, hereditary breast cancers only make about five to 10% of all breast cancers, but BRCA accounts for 25 to 30 of hereditary breast cancers. Um, here are some other ones. So ATM, uh, P10, PALP, B, TP53, which is uh, Lefermini. Um, so some genetic things that you might have heard of, check two. Um, yeah, and people with BRCA or hereditary breast cancer tend to be diagnosed earlier around age 40 to 45, about 20 years earlier than other people with breast cancer uh, than a normal person. So, so the BRCA mutation, one in 40 Ashkenazi Jewish people carry a BRCA1 or a BRCA2 mutation, both men and women. It's about 10 times higher than the general public. So there's increased risk of breast, ovarian, prostate, pancreatic cancer and melanoma, and black women are, are more common than white women to carry BRCA, but less than Ashkenazi Jewish, but are less likely offer to be offered genetic counseling. So how is breast cancer detected? Screening mammography is our gold standard. Early detection of breast cancer in asymptomatic women, so it's those cancers that are not being felt on the surface of the breast, but rather in the deeper areas, the smaller cancers, the earlier stage cancers, Mammography was popularized in the 1970s um, and it has been shown to significantly reduce breast cancer mortality time and time again with multiple evidence-based studies. So the MQ, oh, I, you know, I, I had a more updated slide, but um, MQSA is Act, the Mammography Quality and Standard Act of 1992. It basically was made in 92 to make sure that all mammography centers have, have the same level of quality. We have, there's 
uh, lots of physics and, and uh, testing that is done by the mammography centers. And also um, for the doctors and technologists, we have to read a certain amount of mammograms every year in order to maintain certification. Um, and it actually says that you have to have standardized reports. And so I wanted to show this because I think that the mammography reports can be very confusing yes. if you've ever read it. Uh, I highly encourage you to do after hearing this lecture because it'll make more sense. But at the end of each uh, report, so, um, so I have to plug this by saying that, like, once you understand the lexicon, mammography becomes surprisingly, shockingly easy to understand. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like a recipe for a cake. Like we put in one of four things um, for breast density, we put one of four things for our bi rats classification, how suspicious, not one in six things, how suspicious we think it is. So our job, our intention now is to break that down so that you can get your report in the mail and understand exactly what it says from the top to the bottom of the report. Right. So they're always going to say it ha by law, it has to include your breast density. So number one. So I feel like people in the past have overlooked that. You know, obviously it means more now. We'll talk about that. And also at the end of um, each report, there's a BIRADS category. So that stands for breast imaging reporting and data system. This is what it would look like. So off a of screening mammogram, you could only get a zero, one, or two. Okay. Zero means we need more information. So Unfortunately, if you have an obvious cancer on a screening mammogram, you're there for a screening mammogram. You're going to get a zero, okay? They're going to say, we need more information. It's also the same if you just have, if we need your old films, you're going to get a zero. So off a of screening mammogram, you really can't tell how suspicious we are unless you like read the, the report. But most of the time, you know, it's a zero. One means it's negative. We're, we're called one and two or mean it's normal. Um, we, that's what we're hoping for. Um, so if it is a zero, that means that we bring you back for a diagnostic mammogram. Oh, sorry. We bring you back for a diagnostic mammogram. We do additional views if we need. We do an ultrasound if we need. You meet with the radiologist, and then we tell you what we think. We tell you either it, it's probably benign. There's a certain category that falls into that. We're saying it's essentially less than 2% chance of cancer. If it falls into that category, we follow you every six months for two years. And we're not just making it up. There are certain instances where it falls into the BIRADS 3 category. Um, when, you, when it starts to get suspicious, so you get a category 4 or 5, uh, 4 means it's suspicious, but it's anywhere between 2 and 95%. That's huge. Yeah. So like you could have a cyst that's a little complicated that needs to be aspirated. That's a 4. But also a very suspicious mass might be a 4C. So they're not all masses or biopsy recommendations are created equal. It's 25% of the virus core is cancer. Yeah. yeah. Um, so one out of four biopsies that we do end up needing to go to surgery. Mm -hmm. Um, needing to, so that's that's pretty still reassuring if you get a BIRADS 4 category. You're still yeah. in a good spot where it potentially might not end up being cancer. A category 5 means it's highly suggestive, meaning if we get it, we biopsy it and we get benign, we're going to say it needs to come out. I don't buy it. Something's not right here. Um, all right. And then the last category is just if you've been diagnosed with cancer and we're still using imaging to follow you in some way, shape, or form. Exactly. All right, so this is where it gets dicey. So when should you start screening mammogram? It's not dicey for us. No, it's not dicey <laughs> for us. So it's, it should be an easy question, right? But it really depends on who you ask. And, and it's, it's, it's overwhelming how many uh, different recommendations are out there. Um, so I'm going to break it down by, by organization. But I'm going to start with this. At 40 every year saves the most lives, okay? So recommendations are out there from other um, institutions, but all all societies agree that 40 every year saves the most lives. You but should they, be scratching your heads right now. <laughs> okay, but so so 40, um, American College of Radiology and American College of Gynecology support 40 every year. American College, American Cancer Society says 45 with the option to start at 40. And then it also says annually till you're 55, but then every two years with the option to continue screening mammogram every year. So really they kind of like choose your own adventure. What, what They seem one? confused. Right. They're People following their guidelines are probably confused. Their patients are probably confused. And U.S. Preventative Task Force says 50 every two years. And then, all right, so they're all over the place. And then when do you stop? So some of them say 75, which is crazy to me yeah. because my mom is 75 and she's a good 75. My grandma's 101 yeah. in November. 
I mean, if you follow her Instagram, you know that her grandma Lena is 96. She's had breast cancer four times, including like a few weeks ago. There are good years after 75 yeah, people. Like right. <laughs> we've seen it. Right. So, so, you know, we typically say continue screening as long as you're in good health and your life expectancy is like going to be a few years and you're willing to undergo additional testing and biopsies if warranted or a treatment. And treatment doesn't mean you have to get chemotherapy. Her grandma was just diagnosed with breast cancer for the fourth time. She's getting something called cryotherapy where they just freeze it. So there's lots of non-invasive, like minimally invasive ways to treat breast cancer. That doesn't mean you have to have a major surgery. So yeah. So this is why there's conflicting recommendations. So the reason is because the earlier you start, the denser you are and the harder it is, to, you're going to have more benign things that exist in your breast. So you're more likely to get called back for something that is not cancer. You're going to have more mammograms over your lifetime. And you may warrant a biopsy, you may need a biopsy that is not cancer. And basically they cite the anxiety with that whole experience as why women should not get it. But to me, um, and there's a higher recall rate in younger women. We don't have things to compare it to, like Eve said, you know, we're seeing your breasts for the first time. So as you come and get established, we know what your breasts look like, but the first times are always the hardest, no matter when you start. Um, so, you know, it may lead to a little, it may lead to anxiety and unnecessary biopsies. So it says, while early screening reduces breast cancer mortality, there are a number of potential harms, including false positive results. So a biopsy that's not cancer, that result in unnecessary biopsies, increase the stress and anxiety related to a possible diagnosis of cancer. So, so wait, I just wanna say, so this, this, this op-ed came out, don't you worry your pretty little head about breast cancer. Like we don't do this for men. Like men, we say prostate, you know, pr prostate exam starting, I don't even know what the recommendations are, but we, nobody puts their personal opinions into the recommendation of well, men can't handle it. So, right. I, I don't think we should be doing the same for women. So I can't remember if this was my, one of my mentors and colleagues, Dr. Debbie Kopit, but someone in my past said this, no one ever died from a breast biopsy. Think about it. Right. And, and not to minimize a breast biopsy. And, you know, we do them all the time. They, they, it does cause, you know, I always say the anxiety is the worst part waiting for the results. You know, there's a possibility you might have cancer. You probably don't, but you know, you don't know where we're at. And, but then, you know, most people get the diagnosis and move on with their lives. If, if it's benign, we thank God and we move on with our lives. Um, there are a few people that, you know, it was really traumatic and I get that and I'm not trying, and they might not be the people that would want to do screening every year. So it's really about what you value. Would you value finding breast cancer early at the risk of having a biopsy that wasn't cancer over, you know, your, your 10 year course of extra mammograms? Um, you know, but what we do know is that annual screening mammography starting at age 40 leads to the greatest reduction in mortality and saves the most lives. Um, so we say average risk, average risk. So if you're high risk, this is different, but average risk women should start at age 40 every year. Um, higher risk women should start earlier, may be benefit from supplemental screening modalities. We usually say age 30 or 10 years before your earliest first degree relative. So if your mom was at 45, you might want to start at 35. Um, uh, high risk, if you're high risk, you may benefit from MRI or ultrasound. That's more for average risk. Um, there's also contrast enhanced mammography. We'll talk about it a little bit. We do that here at Cooper. Um, yeah. Cancer, here, I'll do this. So why age 40? So breast cancer is a big deal for women in their 40s. It happens. And, and you know, women in their 40s are productive members of society. They're usually working. They usually have young kids. So, and one year, one third of all years of life loss are from di women diagnosed in their 40s. So if you die at 45, you've lost a big chunk of potential years of life, as opposed to somebody, you know, who's diagnosed in their 80s, it's a little different. You know, they may not have as long to live. So, you know, a woman's life saves in their 40s is a big deal. Um, and all of the organizations agree that starting at 40 saves the most lives. So that's what we'll leave you at. What, what, what we'll leave you at. Um, what we tell our patients, starting at 40 saves the most lives. Early detection of breast cancer leads to better prognosis. Um, it depends on, your, on you and your values. Would you be willing to go through a biopsy only to find it wasn't breast cancer, but at the potential of finding breast cancer in an earlier stage? If the answer is yes, you might want to start at 40 every year. That's what I can say about that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's a tough one because it, you know, there it is, we get asked that a lot and there's no easy answer and it's really a personal opinion. 
So, um, so just to kind of give you a little tour of what our office space looks like, standard mammographic views when you're in that machine getting compressed, we're getting two views of each breast, the cranial caudad view, which is from superior to inferior, as Robin <laughs> Banner White is demonstrating. And then medial lateral oblique, we, um, it's kind of at a 45 degree angle, so we can see that pectoralis muscle. Can you please show Dr. Roth the yep, pectoralis muscle? There you go. <laughs> All right, very nice. So that's our standard mammogram. Um, so digital breast homosynthesis was approved by um, the FDA. It minimizes the effect of overlapping breast tissue. So it increases cancer detection and it decreases callback rate, particularly those false positives um, that both, both you and we hate having to address. So it's most helpful on baseline studies in women with dense breasts. Um, we can double the dose of standard 2D mammography, but lower than the MQSA recommendation of three milligrams. So we are entire, even though it's an increased dose from 2D, we are entirely comfortable with the dose. Um, and ultimately in the benefit of increasing breast cancer detection at an earlier stage. And most, and a lot of places now are getting rid of the 2D mammogram completely. You get a, you get a reconstructed 2D mammogram off the 3D mammogram, and we're feeling more comfortable that that gives us the information that we need. Um, so what most people are getting 3D mammograms or digital breast homosynthesis when they get their mammogram. Um, so screening, I want to break down the, the difference between screening and diagnostics. So screening by definition means you're asymptomatic. Um, you're just picking a woman that, that's of the age and, and doing the annual test. Um, the patient at our institution, they usually come in for the mammogram and leave and they get the results in the mail um, within 30 days. It's usually in their thing, in their, uh, their uh, chart much quicker than that. Um, and if something's abnormal, you'll have to come back. As opposed to a diagnostic mammogram, a diagnostic mammogram or a study is when a patient has a breast complaint certainly a lump pain discharge. They usually meet with the doctor and get results that day. We get additional mammogram views and ultrasound if needed. Um, so it's a different type of study. Um, you know, usually symptomatic patients usually require a diagnostic mammogram, a diagnostic examination, not a screening examination. Exception would be like bilateral diffuse intermittent breast pain, which is considered a normal type of breast pain. Um, if you're under 30, we would usually start with an ultrasound. Um, also, if you're pregnant, we might start with an ultrasound, but pre uh, mammograms are fine in pregnancy. We try to avoid them if we can, but if we need to, we definitely do it. Um, so what if you have a lump and you're told your imaging is normal? And this happens uh, uh, sometimes. So there are some cancers that are really not seen well on imaging. Invasive lobular cancer is one of those cancers, or, or even inflammatory breast cancer may look really bad on on palpation, but on, on imaging, we don't see anything. So I always tell people, you know, if there's a lump that's getting bigger, we don't ignore it. it you know, with the mammogram and ultrasound, we would send you to a breast surgeon and they would decide based on how it feels. They might want to buy it, see it based on palpation, or they might want to get an MRI. So just because a mammogram and ultrasound is normal, doesn't mean you don't have cancer. About, um, the rate of cancer with a negative mammogram and ultrasound is under 4%. So it's not zero, it's small, but it's not zero. So if you have a lump that is growing that you just don't, doesn't feel right to you, I would tell you to go see a breast surgeon and they will decide what to do next. And that's also where that self breast exam comes into play. Like you just exactly. know that it's not right because you've been feeling your breasts for X many years. Yeah. Um, so this was on the news a few, when I was like making this a few years ago and the format most uh, breast com common breast complaints, so naps. So changes in your nipple, armpit, pain and skin and shape um, is a good way to remember it. Um, and breast symptoms should not be ignored. About 43% of breast cancers present uh, with some kind of symptom despite screening. Um, it's more likely to present with a palpable uh, area of concern if you've never had screening or haven't had come in a while. Um, patients are usually younger that present with lumps, obviously, because they might not be in the screening age. Um, and so we wanted to touch on this. This is, again, when you talk about controversial topics, there's lots of breast imaging. So a word about the fizzle exam. So as of 2015, the American Cancer Society no longer recommends the clinical breast exam or self-breast exam for average risk women at any age. So that doesn't count for high risk, 
Um, and they cite like the number of false positives that women might find something and get me to biopsy that is benign and lack of evidence. <laughs> but I mean, from our own common sense and knowledge, we know that women find their own cancer. So the, about 40% of uh, breast cancer are, are discovered on palpation. Nearly 80% of young white women diagnosed with breast cancer find the abnormality themselves. And about 4% of breast cancers are diagnosed before age 40, before the earliest um, recommendation for average risk women to start screening mammograms. So take home point, just know, know your breasts, know, look, know, and, and be aware of how they look and feel and be aware of a change. It, it's common sense. And that's the only way that we're going to find cancers before age 40. Uh, unless you're, you know, people find it by accident often and not even doing a physical exam, but if you're thorough about it, then you'll notice changes. A little on the first. So we kind of, um, we've been very involved with the feel it on the first campaign since we joined us, since we created this Instagram handle. Um, from a technical standpoint, a lot of experts will say to do it on day seven to 14 after the first day of your last menstrual period. But from a practical standpoint, as busy, you know, people who have lives to like manage and other lives to manage, feeling it on the first of every month is the most practical way. So that's why we endorse that particular mm -hmm. campaign. And we just, we've gotten a lot of, yeah. I think, you know, I, it, it's been a very interesting, this is new for me. Yeah. I, you know, we, we post about it and like, it, cause it just makes sense. And the cancer community really like supports it because, you know, there's so many young motivated cancer patients that are like, I found my cancer. Thank you for saying that. Yeah. Because I think that they get confused when they hear the American Cancer Society not supporting it. So I think they like that when doctors, we know that it helps save lives. So we're and just doing doable. what makes sense. This is something you can do lying down, yeah. do at the same time every month. Yeah. If you do it in the shower, standing up, do it the same time every month. Just try and That's hone in on that familiarity of yeah. your of the way your breast feels. Exactly. Um, so I want to talk about breast density. I love breast density. You talk about breast density. <laughs> so so breast density. Whenever we assign a breast density, it's the ratio of fat tissue, fatty tissue, which is the gray that you're seeing in this image, to fibroglandular tissue, which is the white that we're seeing in the image. And the reason why it's so, and you can see the breakdown. So the majority of people follow, fall in the two middle categories. Yeah. So the two denser categories 50%. are 50%. It's that heterogeneously dense breast tissue, which may obscure small masses. That's our like that's our buzz statement, an extremely dense breast tissue, which is 75 to 100% of that white ratio to only 25%, that very small amount of fatty tissue. That's going to be the hardest for us to get. That's a beautiful graphic. I don't know who's doing that. Like it. <laughs> the idea, it's Pauline. It's got to be Pauline. So, um, so that that ratio is, those two ratios of density are particularly challenging for us because breast cancer is white. Mm -hmm. So it's like trying to find a snowflake in a snowstorm. You could see how like a white little cancer right. hanging out in that gray tissue would be much easier to detect. In fact, you can see, look at, show that tiny little mass. That's like yeah. a, that's, that's, we that's would love, for. that's what we're looking yeah. for. And you could see how hard it would be to see something like that in the extremely dense category and the heterogeneously dense category. So, so like we said, about 50% of women fall into this dense breast tissue category. Um, unfortunately, it does lower the sensitivity of mammography um, for independent reasons and also for user error um, that we know about. Mammography misses every other cancer in women with dense breast tissue. That's it's scary. Yeah, scary it is very one. scary. It's very scary for us to see that. Yeah. I think we're um, better than that, but that, you know what? I, I, I know. I think, I think that's different. radiology dependent, but I mean. But just to give you an idea that we know it's not a perfect science. We know we're missing stuff. It's been shown. So we need to use the other tools that we have in our wheelhouse, the ultrasound, the MRI to really increase that early cancer detection rate. And it's also an independent risk factor. So having dense breast tissue, I, I do. It's you. important so because it does. It's in. It's in the. It's, it's in the model. It's that, like the more breast tissue you have, the more likely something in that breast tissue is going to, you know, develop a cancer. Yeah, it's not small. It's one to two times increased yeah. cancer risk. Um, so is it really that bad, or are we just covering our tush? And it's like a little bit of both, but <laughs> it's totally not. It's but look. So this is a thirty-year-old that came in with a palpable abnormality in her right breast, and I. Um, we saw it on ultrasound, but before I even did anything, I was like, well, I want to do a contrast mammogram because I bet there's more stuff in there. 
And she's got bilateral multifocal cancer that you really can't see. I mean, maybe if you're lucky, you would call this, mm -mm. but no. And, and also this, so this is her same breast. I mean, you can kind of see this one, but there's two on the left that we don't see at all. So this just shows you what we're dealing with on the regular. And, um, you know, breast density has become a really hot topic thanks to um, Dr. Nancy Capello. She was diagnosed with stage three C breast cancer two months after having a normal mammogram. And she basically uncovered that, you know, it was the doctors knew about dense breast tissue, but patients weren't being made aware of it. Um, and so her advocacy, um, she started passing leg, uh, legislature to get insurance covered for screening ultrasound um, and also having density reporting to the patient or letters about density notification letters, which we're gonna talk about. So right now, 37 states, it might even be higher than that, and DC requires some level of breast notification after a mammogram, but this is important. Not all states, including New Jersey, tell you about your personal breast density. So it says you may mm -hmm. have dense breast tissue. Mm -hmm. So you don't even know if you do, like you have to actually go back to your report, Everyone see if you have alert. dense breast tissue. And then if you do, then ultrasound or MRI might be for you if you want that extra level of screening. Um, so this is actually what the New Jersey mandates that our letter says, your, new, your mammogram may show that you have dense breast tissue as determined by the BRIRADS, da 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 da. Um, talk to your doctor about this. You know, so we basically tell people, um, women with dense breasts may benefit um, with ultrasound, MRI, um, if you're high risk, we usually alternate them every six months. So we'll do a mammogram in January and then an MRI six months later in June. Um, you know, the pros is that it increases sensitivity. If you do it with a mammogram to 95 to 100%, we're able to find smaller node neg ca negative cancers at an earlier stage is what we're going for. The cons is it may lead to unnecessary biopsies of benign masses. But usually, like I said, the first one's the hardest. Once we know what your breasts look like, then we, you know, then we know that, oh, that mass has been there. That's just Jenna, you know, and, and, <laughs> and then kind of just ignore it. Um, you know, I talked about this a minute ago, but um, contrast mammography, not a lot of places have it, but if they do, it's a great test. It combines mammography with IV contrast. It makes this physiologic component like MRI. Um, abnormal tissue will enhance more than background. Um, it has increased sensitivity, but the, pro the reason we can't find everybody, it's invasive. You have, the, you have to get an IV injection. Uh, you have to get labs if you're over 60, but it's so beautiful. Like, look at this. This is, a, this is a mammogram. This is dense tissue, and this is a normal screening mammogram. And you could see that she's extremely dense, and now she's completely normal. So we feel confident about that. If we, if we made this for everybody, no, we wouldn't have a job. But I wish, we, I wish they would do this for everybody. So we tell patients supplemental screening with ultrasound in the setting of dense breast tissue should be a thoughtful choice after a risk assessment and weighing the risk and benefits. And we encourage women to get more information from their doctors. Okay. So treatment of breast cancer, I'll let you. Okay. So, so breast cancer, we always say breast cancer treatment is not one size fits all. It depends on the stage, the presence or absence of hormone receptors. The three main um, of which we look at are ER, estrogen receptors, progesterone receptors, and uh, HER2 new, a protein involved with cell growth. So regardless, it usually includes some combination of surgery, radiation therapy, chemotherapy, and or hormone therapy or targeted therapy. Those are kind of, you know, the, the tools that we have. Um, oftentimes, uh, lumpectomy will be followed by radiation. That's considered the breast conservation therapy approach, and that's been shown to be just as effective as mastectomy for patients with a few, with only one site of cancer in the breast and tumor under four centimeters. Ultimately, this ends up being a conversation that you have with your breast surgeon, and he or she breaks down all the different factors that are involved in terms of breast size, your own personal breast size and the ratio of tumor to, to breast. But um, it's, it's possible that as an alternative, you may shrink the tumor before surgery with neoadjuvant chemotherapy if the patient desires breast conservation therapy to kind of hit those ratios. Yeah. And to, I'm going to plug our episode one. If you, if you ever have to see a breast surgeon, episode one of our podcast, we sit down with a breast surgeon and ask her all the questions that you would ask if you were newly diagnosed with breast cancer. So I think this is a good, we talk a lot about this in that episode. Um, you know, when we talk about staging, we're really trying to get um, tumors under two centimeters. So 
the, the, the point of, early, of screening mammography is to catch it before it's palpable. Because once it's palpable, it's pretty big. Um, you're not going to really feel it. Or unless superficial. It's, or superficial. But usually, you know, we're trying to catch tumors before they're two centimeters. That would be a stage one if it doesn't have lymph node meds. I'm not going to go too much into this, but, um, you know, that's what we're going for. Um, breast cancer mortality has a great you know, people don't like this slide because they're like five years, like I want to live uh, 20 years, but you got to start somewhere. So, you know, stage one, it's like a hundred percent and stage two, it's, it's up there as well. So, you know, if you catch it early, there's good prognosis, even if it's later stage, there's still good prognosis. Um, there's still a lot of life to be lived. Um, so in summary, We've gone over who gets breast cancer and who's at increased risk. We talked about all the screening controversies <laughs> and then some talked about the appropriate workup and, you know, difference between screening and, and, um, and diagnostic and showed the effect of breast density and talked about ways to improve um, image screening surveillance. So um, there's no clear consensus on when to start and how often. It really is an individual choice based on what you value. Starting age 40 every year saves the most lives. Dense breast tissue lowers our ability to detect cancers, um, and you benefit from um, supplemental screening. It's also an independent, independent risk factor for breast cancer. I do. <laughs> so you might want to consider a supplemental screening if you're motivated for early detection. A um, bunch of references, and then there's more. But just wanted to say thank you so much for this opportunity so much. to talk to our people about this important topic. Wow, that was questions, I guess. amazing. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Robin and Adrian. We're going to get know. into some Who's questions. Who's running the questions? Um, I am My gonna fire alarm went off at home yeah. during this lecture, by the way. <laughs> I'm like, what's going on? Um, no me? worries at all. So um, I don't hear anyone, Jenna or Brianna. Does anyone, do you guys have questions that I, I see a lot? Can you hear me? Hi. Hello? Hi. I submitted a question. What extra care? Okay. With invasive lobular. So somebody I mean, asked about question. invasive lobular cancer. Yeah. That was the one I talked about that can be hard to detect on screening mammograms. MRI, MRI for invasive lobular. Absolutely. We because don't see it. It's ultrasound is the worst. Often we don't see it on mammography at all. When we're lucky, we see it on one view. Yeah. Um, but and contrast enhanced mammo. Yeah, contrast enhanced. If you can't get an MRI, contrast enhanced mammo would be an alternative. Yeah, and, and invasive lobular is one of those cancers that it's often in many sites and you can't tell. So MRI is important for staging and for you know for going. Uh, Are your questions down. Uh, I'm just screening of a mammogram with dense press. Are you guys able to hear me? Um, just... So you know, cysts. Somebody asked about cysts. You know, benign cysts. She said that it was benign. Oh, well, we know that cysts are benign because they, they have they meet certain criteria. If, it, if they're calling it a cyst, they usually mean that it has it's a it's do it five points. Yeah. We need we look for <laughs> an, five things. An imperceptible wall. It's round, it's circumscribed, it's got posterior acoustic enhancement. That's so right. you're yeah. like my resident. I don't What's remember. Don't put me on, on screen. <laughs> if but, it hits all those five points, we're 100 percent confident that it's a cyst. But they could always ask breed and make sure it goes away if anyone's yeah. concerned. Um I gotta see the fire department. Oh my God, you I, go answer your phone. You're like having a fire. Um, so should I be tested for genetic testing with a history of fam cancer in the family? I would see a genetic counselor, honestly. Like if you have a concern and, you know, because honestly, if you have a first degree relative with breast cancer, especially if it's a premenopausal diagnosis, then you probably meet criteria to meet with a genetic counselor. I don't think, I think anyone can benefit from yeah, meeting with a genetic counselor. Yeah, I agree. Counselor. Here's that. Okay, can you discuss breast abscesses and how to prevent them? I don't know how to prevent them. I know how to diagnose them on mammogram and ultrasound. I mean, um, that would be like a breast specialist, like a breast surgeon um, might have more information on that. So we would refer, he would refer you to your friendly breast surgeon or your family yeah. medicine doctor. I mean, it, it's more common in breastfeeding. So obviously making sure your breasts are clean and the baby doesn't bite your nipple and <laughs> cause a crack. So that, we're no, we're going to crack yeah. nipples. Oh, and also um, um, pumping when you're not breastfeeding yeah. is helpful. Oh my God, there's a lot of messages. Yeah, so. <laughs> well, oh, maybe, yeah. So Sherry Rosenberg, that's a great question. So what are your thoughts on adding breast MRI when your breast cancer risk is in the intermediate? So I do think, so question. that is a great question. So there's things called a fast MRI, which some places have where it's not the full MRI. Yeah, I think Penn offers them, right? Yeah. Um, 
So that's a good test. And and there are places that will offer it. You know, you could pay two hundred dollars if you yeah, want that pen. extra level of yeah, out of pocket. I think it's a good idea. At Penn, I don't think we don't offer fast MRIs here, but there are definitely institutions who, and, and that sensitivity is like ninety eight percent, right? Ninety nine. It's the same yeah. as um. If you're high risk, high. you mentioned six months MRI and mammogram. Is MRI much more useful than ultrasound? I do believe so. It's it's a much more um, it's sensitive. sensitive, yeah. And you just get a global overview of the breast. The false positive biopsy rate does go up with breast MRI. That's you know why there would be that conversation. But ultimately, in a high risk patient, we end up biopsying more benign things anyway. So it's kind of a double edged sword, if that makes sense. If Okay. Lori asked, does a contrast enhanced mammogram use gadolinium? No, it uses um, iodinated contrast question. like a CAT scan. And I would use this as an, uh, instead of an MRI for people that you know are uh, claustrophobic or can't get MRIs for certain reasons. I think the contrast mammogram is a great tool for uh, those type of people. Um, and it's an easy test. Our surgeons will send them sometimes just as a quick test. Um, no, thank you. Can you <laughs> next one? And yeah, check out our podcast, The Girlfriend's Guide to Breast Cancer, Breast Health and Beyond. It's available wherever you get your podcasts, uh, Spotify, Apple Podcasts. We just roped in uh, two medical students to help us with a Twitter account. So yeah, that's our next team. platform. <laughs> so a breast self-exam, I we, you know, um, there are some, we're going to post a TikTok probably with a breast self-exam on um, the first, but there are great, if you, there are so many good TikToks out there follow field on the first. They give lots of good information. That's a sensation. I don't know a lot about sensation. You know what? We refer you to our good friends and breast surgeons for sensation sparing mastectomy. Unfortunately, that's not our expertise. Yeah. And what do you say that women don't want to start uh, mammos at age 40 because of extra lifetime risk of radiation? It's Man, not, it's, it's not so significant. Minimal. It it's is like, not significant. It's like background. If you're flying cross country, it's similar to that. So it is really a difference. Um, yeah. It, it is something that you should not, you should not be concerned about in the least. Like I say that with hundred percent confidence. Yeah. Um, Dawn asked a great question. She said, what's the difference between stage and grade? So stage is different than grade. So grade is something that they look at under a microscope, I believe, and they tell how many mitoses versus high per high field unit or something like that. So really doesn't count as a stage. It might tell you that it's more aggressive, but, um, but really the, it's different than the stage. A stage is when it's, you know, is it in the nodes? How big is it? That kind of stuff. It talk. can get confusing oh. because a uh, grade is used for staging, but staging takes a look at the bigger picture. Are the lymph nodes involved? Are there other organs that are involved? That's how you get to your stage. So screening in men, that's actually a great question. And I have to look that up. You know, we don't typically screen men, um, but if they have, we do have some that have genetic predispositions that come in for their, their annual mammogram. Um, usually they're followed by a breast specialist. I do think there is a role if they have a known, like if they're BRCA, um, but I'm not exactly, I would like to get, that's a great question. Yeah. I'm gonna get back to you about that. We maybe would touch base with our geneticist. Yeah. We'll talk to Brooke about that. You muted us when the feedback fabulous uh, I muted you? Oh my God, what? I don't know how to mute. What, <laughs> what happened? How do we unmute everybody? So, Wait, can, can anyone hear us? <laughs> we can hear you. Wait, can you not hear us at all? No, the whole time? Oh my God. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is so us. <laughs> the whole can you hear time. me now? I can hear you on our med students phone. Okay. What happened? It's okay because you know what? You answered all the questions in the chat. <laughs> you provided so over. much great information. Like... Um, and you you ran with it. So so type a. <laughs> technology staff foods have nothing on the booby doc. So <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> But, we'll just keep talking um, until somebody gives us the food. <laughs> well, we don't want to give you the boot. We want to say thank you so much for participating. Oh it's an amazing, amazing, um, lots of information. We were getting messages through the chat. I was getting messages like texts from people saying how okay. great this was and how informative yeah. it was. Um, and so like, we're hoping that we can, uh, um, anyone who has registered for today, you will receive the recording from today. Um, so you'll be able, if you missed something or you were looking to grab one of the slides, you'll be able to see the entire presentation. Uh, you'll get an email to you and it will be on Charcharit's website. Um, we are going to put a evaluation into the chat box. Um, so uh, 
and we'll put that in the chat box so that you can evaluate today's program and provide uh, feedback on the content, on the person. I was not told there would be an evaluation. <laughs> Um, technology snafus aside, I think I think it's good. Um, and we mentioned that this program is part of our first ever Sharsharit Summit to mark Breast Cancer Awareness Month. We have some really amazing, innovative, and educational programs, and they are all fun. I don't know if there anything can top today's program on the fun meter, but I, I, I promise to have really great content the rest of the week. The link to that schedule is in the chat box as well. So I just want to personally thank my friend Robin and her friend Adrian for participating in today. Um, it's really, like we said at the beginning of the of the session, if you are not following the Booby Docs, you should be. They are, are giving great information out there. We are really excited at Char Shower to be able to work with you on this webinar and others. Um, and if you had any questions that weren't answered in the chat, please feel free to email them to Sharshara and we are happy to uh, either pass them along or um, we also have a genetic counselor on staff who is able to answer any genetics related questions if you have something uh, else. But our information is in the chat. If you have any questions, feel free to let us know. And it's been a pleasure doing our girlfriend's guide to breast cancer and breast health and beyond with you guys. Awesome. So, mm -hmm. so much. <laughs> and thank you to everyone thank who participated. So and Thanks for having us. We really enjoyed uh, being with you. Yeah. And also, if you follow us on Instagram, you could always send us a question. We're very accessible. So thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Great. Okay.